Good morning, everyone. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. And Lord, just thank you that we could freely gather here to worship you and to hear from you. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would teach us those things we need to learn. Father, dealing with a difficult subject, dealing with false teachers and uh, just the characteristics of them we're going to be looking at this morning is, Father, you, you bring us back to the Old Testament and some examples of what these false teachers are all about. I pray, Lord, for our worship this morning. We love to worship you. We love to sing praises unto you. And Lord, may these songs that we sing draw us closer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. This morning we'll be reading Psalm 146, 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, In that very day his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that it is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. This morning, if you would, uh, please turn in your Bibles to Jude as we continue our in-depth study of this really powerful little book. And Jude is writing to people who were being swayed by the false teachers, these apostates who have come into the church and brought their doctrines of demons into the church. And Jude is calling for them to earnestly contend for this faith that's been entrusted to them. Don't give in to the false teaching but you've got to stand up for the truth. You've got to stand against these things because these are deadly teachings and they're trying to take you away from God. And what we're seeing today is that we don't want to earnestly contend for the faith, but we want to just get along. And let's face it, that's kind of human nature, right? We don't like to fight. We don't want to get in, into battles with people. We just want to get along with everyone. But you don't get along with apostates, false teachers who are spreading their doctrines of demons. How bad is it? Well, Keep in mind, we're in part two of our study on characteristics of false teachers here in Jude. And remember in part one of our study, we looked at four main points that related to they are, they're dreamers. And they had these visions and they added to the work of God. They took away from the words of God. Um, They had, these imagined, our dreams were just coming from the imagination of their own hearts and nothing to help the people of God by. You know, Paul, in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, talking really about the Judaizers, but you can put false teachers in there in general, he said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. In other words, don't listen to them. Don't hang around them because they are leading people to their destruction with their teachings. Well, the next point was they are defiling the flesh. And again, since they didn't adhere to the word of God, they indulge in sexual immorality. And Obviously, they don't know God. They're not guided by the Spirit of God, and they're driven by the flesh. They are also rejecting authority. Again, false teachers don't know God, and they do what's right in their own eyes. And the authority we follow is God's authority, what God has shown us in his word. 
And we lastly looked at they are speaking evil of dignitaries. You know, they're not following God. They're following their own desires. They're saying whatever they want. And Jude compares these false teachers with Michael the archangel who respected the authority of the devil, not siding with the devil. And he said, you know, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't speak evil against the devil. Well, this morning, as we continue to look at these characteristics of false teachers, we're going to look at the second point they have. And I've broken it down like this. And this is in your bulletin. They have gone the way of Cain. And this is in Jude 1 verse 11. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, what is fascinating to me is Jude just gives these little one-liners, right? There is nothing expounded on this. There's nothing in depth. He just says, hey, this is the way it is. You know, they've gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily for the heir of Balaam for profit and so on. Why does he do it that way? Because he expects us to know these things. (laughs) And so we're going to learn about that today. If you're not familiar with some of these characters here in the Bible, we're going to take a little look at them and see how these apply to these false teachers, these apostates. And here Jude is, again, he's just given us three examples. They didn't get away with this, and neither will the apostates of today get away with it. Now, regarding the coming judgment, including these false teachers, one writer put it like this. He said, our society has become well insulated from the reality of hell. In fact, preachers don't preach about it. Writers don't write about it. Evangelists don't even necessarily warn about it. The culture thinks everyone is basically good and life after death is either happy and full of pleasure or it doesn't exist. Hell is neither politically correct, socially acceptable, or even evangelical these days. We have become so comfortable with the absence of hell from our evangelism that our superficial gospel has no threats, no warnings about eternal torment and eternal suffering. But on the other hand, the Bible is very clear on the reality of hell, very clear on the reality of eternal punishment, very clear on the reality of eternal darkness. Scripture tells us that human history ends with God's judgment on all the ungodly. The severest criticisms given in the New Testament are against false teachers, those who led people astray in the name of God, in the name of Christ. Nothing is going to compare to the suffering of the spiritual phonies the spiritual fakers, the false prophets, the false teachers, the Christian uh, con men, the liberals, the spiritual fakes in priestly garb, the gospel-denying theologians. Theirs is the worst hell of all. In other words, this is a wake-up call. I mean, for those teachers and those churches that are going down this path, it's time to wake up because there is a judgment that's coming. And apart from Christ, you're going to face that judgment. That's how serious this is. So with that as the introduction, let's pick up here in Jude 1, verse 11. And I'm actually going to read verses 8 through 13 because that's the whole context of what we've been looking at. Um, And then we'll focus in on verse 11 this morning. Jude wrote this, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, in the things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude obviously didn't read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? No, I mean, you listen to this, you go, wow, that is heavy, right? Yeah, it's that important. You know, God has this in here because this is, was a serious thing back then, and it's serious today. And he starts out with, 
woe. And that's not a good word. It's usually warning of the judgment of God. In the Dictionary of Bible Themes, it categorizes the use of the word woe in the Bible like this. Woe as an exclamation of judgment on others. Woe as an exclamation of misfortune on oneself. Woe as an exclamation of sadness over others. Or woe may be given to forgiveness, comfort, and deliverance. Yeah, you know, Jude is dealing with these false Jewish leaders, these false teachers. And when Jesus is dealing with the religious leaders of his day, he used the word woe a lot. He used the word hypocrites. Isn't that interesting? These are supposed to be the spiritual men that are supposed to be leading the people of God, and they weren't. Now, it's kind of interesting, you know, today you go, man, you know, if Jesus came back today, everyone would believe him. Well, he was already here, right? And what happened? The religious people rejected him. The common people, the sinners, the ones that knew we needed God were the ones that ended up receiving him. But the Jewish religious leaders were too self-righteous to see their need for a savior. They didn't listen to what the scriptures were saying. And when Jesus did the miracles that were spoken of regarding the Messiah in the Old Testament, they said, he's casting out demons by Beelzebub, by the devil. This is not the work of God. They couldn't accept the fact that Jesus is God. And here's the thing. If these false teachers don't repent and get right with God, they're doomed. That's the tragedy. You know, it's, in many churches today, people don't like to talk about sin because it makes people uncomfortable. Who are you to tell me that I'm a sinner? I'm sorry, I'm not telling you a sinner, but God is. And he has a little more clout than me. You know, you could agree with me or disagree with me. <clears throat> doesn't matter. But you disagree with God, there is a judgment. So what Jude is speaking of here is for these apostates, warning that judgment is coming. Don't follow these guys. And this first example is the way of Cain. You know, back in Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel brought their offerings to the Lord. And Cain brought the fruit of the land, and Abel brought a sheep from the flock. And Cain's profession was agriculture. Abel's was livestock. Neither were wrong professions, even though some like to kind of make a big deal of this. They, these laborers, you might say, were part of the curse, working hard for a living. But they also took time to worship the Lord and bring unto him a sacrifice. So they knew God required sacrifices. And Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstborn from his flock. And God rejected Cain's offering and accepted Abel's. Why? Well, you know, some feel that it's because God required a blood sacrifice before him. But keep in mind, God accepted grain sacrifices too. I think there's another important issue here. But first understand this word offering in Hebrew, in Genesis, is minka. And it speaks of any type of offering, not just a blood offering. Why did God reject Cain's sacrifice and accept Abel's? Well, in Hebrews 11.4, we get a little insight. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. What was Abel's sacrifice done in? Faith. There's the key. What was Cain's offering done in? <laughs> Not in faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Cain didn't have faith in God. This was a religious activity for him. Do we see that today? Well, yeah, there is a lot of 
uh, churches, cults also, that are very religious in their activities. And God doesn't accept it, just like he doesn't ex didn't accept Cain's. Now, how did they know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's wasn't? I mean, obviously, there had to be something, right? And I personally think fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice, and Cain's just kind of stood there. Nothing. There had to be some kind of visible acknowledgement. I'm accepting Abel's. I'm rejecting yours, Cain. And we see it in the scriptures. Remember Elijah's encounter with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You know, he challenged them to see who can consume the sacrifices that were offered to their gods. And Elijah said, you guys go first. And so they were there all day, you know, screaming, yelling, nothing. And Elijah, he was a little sarcastic, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of like Elijah. It's like, hey, maybe your gods are sleeping, you know? Maybe they're on vacation. Yell a little louder. Maybe they can't hear you. I, I, th I think he was pretty funny with that. And they got even more crazy. They're cutting themselves now and jumping up and down. Nothing happened. So Elijah says, enough. We're done here. And he has his sacrifice covered with water three times. He calls upon the Lord. And in 1 Kings 18.38, we're told, Then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea, I think, of what happened with Abel's sacrifice. I think, boom, God accepted it. And I think, you know, I think that's what was going on here. And out of this, because Cain saw how this all took place, his is still there, in Genesis 4, 5, it says that Cain was very angry. He was burning with anger. And because of his disobedience, his countenance fell. He was, his pride was hurt. He was angry. And it affected his whole, whole life. He was not a believer. But Abel was. Why? Because, again, he acted in faith where Cain did not. And for Cain, like I said, it was more of a religious activity, nothing more. He didn't have a relationship with God, just rituals, and, you know, God didn't accept it. And again, think about the number of people out there who try to approach God doing it their own way. You know, they feel it's fine and they're, gonna, they're not going to listen to any other way because they're right. But there is only one way to approach God, and that's through Jesus Christ, and it's done by faith. You know, I had uh, a couple of Jehovah Witnesses come to my door a few weeks ago and hand me some information on, you know, why there's pain and suffering in the world. And um, they asked me if I would read it. I said, sure, I'll read it. And I said, uh, and they said that they would come back. And, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm going, oh, this is great. You know, there's nothing about Jesus in here. So all about pain, yeah, okay, but who's the one that can ease our pain, comfort our hearts? It's Jesus. And why do they leave Jesus out? Because it's all about him. You look at, and I, I challenge you to do this, look at the cults today. Every one of them denies the deity of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because Jesus said in the Gospel of John, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It's pretty serious. So they attack the deity, and they make him a lesser god or the brother of Lucifer or whatever. They just don't have faith in the true and living God. And there are a lot of people out there who put their faith in all kinds of things. But in the end, you know, it's kind of disappointing. You know, uh, you probably heard this story before from me, but many years ago in the New Yorker magazine, there was an account of a Long Island resident, and he ordered this very expensive and ex sensitive barometer from Amber Crombie and Fitch. Very big company, right? And the instrument arrived at his home, but man, he was so disappointed. And the needle on this instrument was pointing to hurricane. 
Well, it drove him crazy. He shook it, you know, that's not something you really want to do with a sensitive device like that. And it never moved. It stayed on Hurricane. So he wrote this scathing letter to the store, and on the following morning on the way to his office in New York, he mailed it. Well, he returned that evening to his Long Island, uh, uh, to Long Island, and he found that not only the barometer was missing now, but his house was gone because that needle pointed correctly. The month was September, the year 1938, and the day of the ter terrible hurricane that almost leveled Long Island. You see, the information was there. What was the problem? He didn't believe. And that's a lot of people today. The information is all here, but they don't want to believe. They don't want to read this. Why? Because they're afraid that this is the truth. And then they're going to have to make a decision. I've seen it so often. People will put down the Bible who have never read the Bible. You know what they've read? The comments of other people. That's meaningless. Read the Bible. Start in the Gospel of John or start in Romans. Read Mark. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes. But just read it. You don't, you, believe, you don't believe there's a God? You don't believe this is the Word of God? You read it, but be open to what God is showing you. It is kind of amazing what God does, isn't it? For Cain, did he have all the information? Absolutely. Where did he get it from? His mom and dad, right? Adam and Eve. They walked with God. For how long? I don't know before sin entered the picture. But they walked with God. So they passed the information on to their children. They knew all these things. Abel knew, and he believed by faith. But Cain didn't, and judgment came upon him. And judgment comes to those who don't believe. Psalm 78, 22. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yeah, judgment comes. And the way of Cain is simple. It's unbelief. Look at next that they have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. Wow. Wow. A heir of Balaam. You could read of his story in Numbers chapters 22 through 25 and chapter 31. And the way you can remember about Balaam, Balaam was a for-profit prophet. He was very interested in money. That was his big thing. And the king of Moab, Balak, hired him to curse the children of Israel because he was afraid of the children of Israel coming in and destroying them. He had heard the stories about them. And so Balak hired him, curse the children of God. What's interesting is God said, Balaam, don't go. And what did Balaam do? He wanted the money. And God said, well, fine. If you want to go, go, but only say the words that I give you. Nothing more, nothing less. So he did that. He spoke forth four blessings upon the children of Israel. Uh, Balak kept moving them to different areas. Okay, try and curse them from over here, from over here. And he couldn't. He just spoke forth these blessings. So Balak is just furious. He hired Balaam to curse the children of Israel, not bless them. They don't need blessings. They wouldn't need a cursing. So Balak's not getting what he wanted from Balaam. Do you think he's going to pay him for this? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What would this prophet do since he's losing money now? Again, that's his whole premise here is to make money. I believe he told the king of Moab how to get God to curse the children of Israel. In Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3, I think we get the picture. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, 
and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the, their sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Bel of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. How did this all play out? Listen carefully. The women of Moab came before the men of Israel and seduced them, enticed them to sin. You know, they were all dressed up, wearing their short little skirts, whatever they wore in those days. You know, make up to the hilt, and the men of Israel fell for it. And many of these pagan religious practices were centered around sexual immorality, and as they got the children of Israel to have these sexual relations with them, it was based on the worship of their gods. So Balaam could not curse the children of Israel. He got the children of Israel to move away from the blessings of God, and actually they were cursing themselves. And was God angry at them? Yeah, absolutely. 24,000 Jews died in this plague. The, those that were the leaders were to be hung and placed for all to see. And they joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Who were they to be joined with? God. But look at what this did to their lives. The word joined is a Hebrew word that speaks of being fastened or linked together. Here's the key. Light and darkness cannot coexist or should not coexist. We should not be joined together. And it's really hard to try and be joined together and still serve the Lord. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 plays it out for us in verses 15 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What have we joined ourselves to? That's the big question. Are we joined to the Lord? Now, I know the world, there's a lot of temptations pulling us all over the place. But stay focused upon the Lord. This whole incident here with Balak and the children of Israel, who gave Balak this plan? Well, I think it was Balaam. Because in Numbers 31.16, we're told this. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. We're told right there that this counsel, this information that was given to Balak was done by Balaam. I can't curse them, king, but I know how they can get cursed. So show me the money, right? Revelation 2.14, Jesus tells us in his letter to the church in Pergamos, but I have a few things against you because you have there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. There again, we're told that Balaam gave Balak this information on how to get the children of Israel cursed. And it worked then, and it still works today. we got to be careful. You know, people, for Balaam, he wanted to make money, make a profit, and he did it at any cost. That phrase, run greedily, literally means to be poured out or to stampede toward. That's what they're moving towards. You know, it, it's, you could see it with the televangelists on TV, how they're always asking for money. How sad. You know, a few years back, and I don't know if I recently told you this or not, but I got um, this prayer rug 
and I was supposed to put this prayer rug down and kneel upon it and make my prayers. Sadly, it was a prayer piece of paper. It wasn't even a rug. And it was only this big, so I don't know how big they thought I was. I'm not a big guy, but, you know. To... And then they said, and if you could send it back with a donation. You're asking for a piece of paper back? Are you kidding me? But why are they doing this? To make a profit. I'll just put a warning out there. There's been a lot of really, really good Christian movies put out recently that made lots of money. Be careful now. Because there will be those who will be making movies and put the Christian stuff on it, tags on it, to make a profit off of God. I mean, we've seen it with so many books, you know, over the years. You know, there was the book, The Prayer of Jabez, which I'm not going to go into details with. But then, you know, there was the prayer of Jabez for kids, for newborns, for a prayer of Jabez for kids who are still in the womb. I mean, they had everything for them. Prayer of Jabez, why did they keep doing that? To make money, to make a profit. I do not want to make a profit off of God and one day have to stand before him. You know, we try to give God's word out as much as we can for free. All my notes, all the videos, all the audios are on the internet. You could just download them. They're there. Why? Because these aren't mine. They're God's. But people, wow, they step, stampede forward to the heir of Balaam for profit. And again, he was a for-profit prophet. And Having money is not, there's not, nothing wrong with having money. Money is, is nothing. It's a piece of paper or whatever, right? It's the love of money that causes people to do all kinds of evil things. I'll give you just a, a, an idea of where some of these guys are at, and this information is, is out there. Guess how much Kenneth Copeland is worth? Just guess. $20 million? 30, 50 million, 760 million dollars. How much money do you need, right? You're serving God. Benny Hinn, 42 million. Jesse Duplantis, 55 million. Joel Osteen, only 40 million. Creflo Dollar, 27 million. And what do you hear? You hear them begging for money. If I ever beg you for money, just shoot me because my time is over, really. There's no, no point to really continue on. As far as I can tell, and I've you know, read Genesis to Revelation many, 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 many times, God's not broke. He owns everything. He doesn't need anything. Once in a while, I'll let you know if there's a need or something's going on, but that's it. Because God is not broken. I'm not here to make a profit. I'm here to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and to build you up in the faith, to teach you the things of God so you can go out and do the work of the ministry. That's the bottom line. But again, Christianity is a money maker. And you just have to twist things a little bit. I don't want to... I don't want to hurt anyone here, but, you know, the whole Chosen series. I'm sorry if it offends anyone, but sorry. I, I, I cannot watch it. I've never watched it, actually. And one of the reasons is because they twist the scriptures. They have a Mormon on board writing this stuff. And one of the things that Jesus said is, in this series is, I am the law of Moses. And go, well, what's the big deal? Because it's from the Book of Mormon. <laughs> it's not from the Bible. <laughs> and when one of the writers was asking about, or one was asked about this, he said, well, Jesus could have said it. Well, yeah, then you could put anything in there, can't you? You could say, well, you know, Jesus said that, you know, the average height of men who are going to heaven will be 5'6" which happens to be my height. <laughs> no, you can't put what you, if Jesus, 
If you're saying Jesus might have said it, then he didn't say it. He either said it or he didn't. Did Jesus say a lot of other words that aren't written in here? Absolutely he did. But we can't guess what he was going to say because the Holy Spirit has given to us the things we need of what he said. And we have to be careful with that. For Balaam, his desire was to become personally wealthy by making a business out of his service to God. And false teachers of today are very good at doing this. They speak out of both corners of their mouth at once. They suppress the truth in order to increase their income. And they're greedy, making the house of God a house of merchandise, just like Jesus confronted the Jewish religious people at the beginning of his ministry and at the end. The house of God is to be a place of prayer, of worship. You've made it a den of thieves, he said. And that's what Balaam was doing. How important was all this money? Well, it was pretty important to him because he went after it. How long did it last? Not long. Because in Numbers 31, verses 7 and 8, and they warred against the Midianites just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of the house who were killed, Evi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. He was killed. So how long did he get to enjoy all that money? Is there pleasure in sin? Absolutely, or people wouldn't fall into it. But it's very short-lived as we see here. And the way of greed, trying to profit off of God, you're not going to get away with it. That's what Judah's talking about with these false teachers. And the way of Cain was greed. Again, he was a for-profit prophet. Well, lastly, the last part of verse 11, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. The rebellion of Korah is found in Numbers chapter 16, and Korah was kind of this ringleader in a rebellion that also included Dathan and Abiram, and 250 others joined with them. And I'll just read Numbers 16, verses 1 through 3 for you. Now Korah, the son of Ezar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and An, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? So Korah was upset. He was a Kohathite. But he wasn't content, wasn't satisfied with what God had called him to do. And you think, well, what kind of menial task, you know, did the Kohathites have? Well, think about this. These guys were to be in charge of taking care of the holy things of God. The Ark of the Covenant, the Table of Showbread, the seven-branched oil-burning lamp, and so on. They were responsible for carrying these as the children of Israel were going to move. And then the setup of them as they made camp again. Yeah, they weren't priests, but they had a God-ordained role. And Korah said, I'm not satisfied with that. And a lot of other people, he got to join in with them. Did Moses place himself in this position as leader of the children of Israel? No, God did. God placed him there. So here the issue really is jealousy, discontentment, and it's not pretty, and it led to rebellion against authority. They didn't like the position that God had given them in serving, and they tried to usurp the position that God gave to Moses and Aaron. So they rebelled against them, and they tried to get the rest of the children of Israel to follow along with them. And people try to do that today, you know? Why? Well, when they reject authority and speak evil of those in leadership positions, you end up walking in the rebellion of Korah. And it's interesting, you know, I've seen churches that have split, have divided up, because someone within the church wanted to be a pastor, and so they called people in the church and said, hey, I'm starting a work here, come with me. 
And they did. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's really not how a church starts. You don't divide it like that. But again, that's just rebellion because of the leadership in the church they don't want to submit to. You know, I love the people that want to be pastors but have no clue of what it's about. You know, well, you just come up on a Sunday and Thursday and you teach and you go home. It's a little bit more than that. In between my golf games and stuff, I do have to study. I understand that. But here's the thing. You are dealing with the congregation, and everyone goes through difficult times. And you yourself, as a, me as a pastor, go through difficult times. I mean, when my children years ago were in rebellion against God and things were just horrible, I still came up and taught. I didn't miss. Was it heartbreaking? It was. But through it all, God was teaching me. As I was teaching the lessons, he was teaching me to rely on him, to trust in him. You know, today was a very difficult day for me. You know, I love my grandchildren. Um, I think that the, they are the blessing I received and my wife received for having children um, is grandchildren. They are just wonderful. And now my little grandchild, is not little, he's 14, has diabetes. And that's very hard for me. I'd rather take anything. Lord, just do it to me. Don't take it away from him. I already have diabetes. Give me something else. I don't care because he's my grandchild. But this I know is God always gives me the strength to do what I need to do, no matter how hard it is. And that's what you have to focus on. It's not easy. And usually people that are trying to usurp the position have no idea, and they're usually in it for a short period of time. I've seen it. I, I tried to warn people that were getting involved with a, a teacher that basically was kicked out of Calvary in California, went to Illinois, and they didn't really want him there. And so he came up to Wisconsin. Well, thanks a lot. And I tried. I said, hey, you know what? Don't follow this guy. Caused a big church split again. It was devastating. And within probably a half a year, he was done and moved on. Well, what about all those people? See, it's, it's not a, a pastor is a shepherd caring for the sheep that God has entrusted to them. You don't just get up and leave because it's too hard or whatever. But these guys had no idea. They wanted the position. They wanted the title. And they weren't satisfied with what God had given them, which was a huge responsibility. I mean, they didn't even get to come in until and take these articles until they were covered because, again, they weren't priests. They weren't allowed to. But they still got to move all these things. I'll give you an example because what happens is these guys start coming against those who come against them. Say, hey, you know, what you're doing is wrong, and they don't like that. You know, false prophets are very much like that. You know, case in point, and again, I don't mean to offend anyone, but Benny Hen, I don't think, is a, a prophet of God. And so when people come against him, well, this is what he said. And this is from several years back, but listen. You wonderful people of God, quit attacking men of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, bro brother. You watch out. I don't mind if they attack Benny and the way he is and the way he walks, but don't attack the, this man of God, Paul Crouch. There's a group here in California that thinks they are the judgment seat of Christ. They judge everything you do. Listen here, fellow, let me tell you something. You're not my judge. Jesus is my judge. You walk around with your stiff lip and your collar on your neck. Dear God in heaven, I just wish I could. Oh, they call it a ministry, my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that says, if you don't like them, kill them. I really wish I could find it. But there's nowhere in the Bible where it says it. 
Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'd blow your head off. Okay, well, that's a minister of God, right? I don't know how people listen to that. And when you listen to what he says, you have to wonder, why doesn't anyone hold him accountable, right? I'll give you an example. On TBN's Praise the Lord program, Benny Hinn had a prophecy from God. This is from God. Okay, you, you put the tag, prophecy from God. It's got to be true. This is what you can do. If your loved one dies, instead of taking them to the mortician, the funeral home, prop them up in front of the television and turn on TBN and God will raise them from the dead. I guess you... I, I, I don't know, you know, maybe it's probably, it's probably healthier for them being dead to watch it, but I, why would you say that? This is from God? How many held him accountable? You see, this is the problem, and we see it today with so many of these false teachings that are out there. These people say it, and no one holds them accountable. We have to be fruit inspectors, and we check things out with what people say according to the Word of God. Not, we don't judge what their, where their heart is at, why they're doing these things. We do it according to God's Word. Okay, this is against God's Word. And there's, you know, again, I, I guess these guys are very charismatic, and so people follow them. They're exciting because they say these things that are just, you know, mind-blowing but then they don't come to pass. Now, here's the thing. Rebellion. Is it bad all the time? Think about that. What about rebellion against government? Are we always to obey the government? No. I know that's shocking, let me share with you, first of all, what Paul said, and then we'll, I'll share a little bit about this. In Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes." For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Governments have the authority from God. God places leaders in positions. I know that's a hard one for us because we see some of these people and go, oh my gosh, why are they even there? How did they get in there? I guess God wanted a man. But here's the thing. Do we have to do everything that the government says? You know, I had to deal with it with the whole COVID issue, and that was a pretty difficult time. And, uh, you know, when COVID first came out, it was deadly. And I realized people argued with me over that, but I had a son who worked in the emergency room as a nurse practitioner down in Madison, and every single day he saw people dying. He wore that hazmat suit all day long and he was broken he said i don't know how much longer i can do this over time the covid virus mutated and become became less deadly but initially the governor closed a lot of businesses churches down because it was so deadly we we followed what he was saying but then things kind of changed and things opened up and we started having services again. And my premise was, you're all adults. If you want to wear a mask, praise the Lord, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, praise the Lord, don't wear a mask. There are people upset with me. 
Why aren't they wearing masks? Well, if you're wearing a mask, then don't be afraid. We're all adults. But again, when I saw the bar next door open and people freely partaking over there and you know, the governor saying bars were important for people's health, I'm thinking, you know what, churches are more important for people's health, okay? We need to keep going here and whether they like it or not, we're gonna do it and we did. You know, the only reason we go against government authority is when it goes against God's word. If a, the government says to a woman, you need to have an abortion, you obey God rather than man. If the government says you cannot teach against homosexuality and these other sins, we obey God rather than men. Do you see the point here? Again, kind of pick our battles. We, we're battling for God and we're battling for the lost. If, again, the Bible says you can't, or the government says you can't teach from the Bible, tough. You can't teach about Jesus, tough. I'm going to obey God. Will it cause trouble? It might. Is that rebellion? Yeah, but that's a rebellion according to what God has said in his word. That's the only reason. You see the difference? And it's important. You know, think about when Nebuchadnezzar had built that huge idol and he commanded everyone, when you hear the sound of music, not, you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music, but you know what I mean. They are to bow down and worship this idol. And if you don't, well, you're going to be put to death. He gave the command. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego refused. These three Hebrew guys, young guys, they refused to bow down. And he was, Nebuchadnezzar was furious. Like, I'll give you one more chance. They're like, well, you know, O king, we're not going to bow down. I don't know if God is going to spare us from this fiery furnace or not, but no matter what, we worship him. Well, that just heat those fires seven times more in that kiln and throw them in there. He took, had his men throw these three Hebrew kids in there. All those soldiers that did that were burned crisp. And the king's looking in there and goes, how many people do we put in there? Three. I see four. One of them looks like the son of God. Oh, yeah. He calls them out. And the only thing that was burned on these men were the ropes that bound them. They were set free. You see, that's where we disobey government. And again, look at their lives were on the line. They didn't know if they were going to live or die, but they knew who they served. And that's got to be our uh, way of looking at things. The Christians in the early church had to pay homage to Caesar, bow the knee before him. Well, they couldn't because they only bow the knee to the Lord. And many were put to death because of that. You see? Dr. Martin Luther King, in his letter from the Birmingham jail, put it like this. One is not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. He went on to explain an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law the law of God. Absolutely. You know, think about it. Years and years ago, it wasn't a big issue because a lot of our, our national laws were in accordance with God's word. I mean, think about it. 1960s, all the stores were closed on Sunday. To have a Little League baseball game or a soccer game was there is no way that's going on on a Sunday. Why? Because Sunday was a day to worship God. Isn't that interesting? For a, a nation they claim was never a Christian nation, look at the things we were doing and how we changed. But now things have changed. Think about it. 
They want to take your child away if you don't allow your child who wants to change their gender to have it done. Are you kidding me? You see, I'm going to obey God on this one. Sorry. As one Christian columnist commented, he said, We no longer base our laws on the bedrock of God's law, which has forfeited his blessing and protection on our nation. As a result, our economy is hanging by a thread with insurmountable national debt. Our families are breaking. Our churches are ducking for cover with the threat of government overreach. We are now joined with Iran and other God-hating regimes that are dedicated to wiping freedom off the globe. The words of the prophet Jeremiah sting us with an eerie similarity. Why is the land ruined, laid waste like a desert so that no one passes through? The Lord said, because you have forsaken my law which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart. We have ba abandoned the God of the Bible, the very God of our founding. Our spiritual foundation has been compromised. George Washington said, it's impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Aren't we finding that out today? Look at it. When we reject God's law by removing his influence from every vestige of society, how can we rightly govern ourselves? And the answer is we can't and we're not. And again, this attack is not about this immorality uh, coming forth or that one. It's an attack on our faith. It's an attack on our God. The day after the Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage, a leading gay activist came out and said the following, and listen carefully. This was never about legalizing gay marriage, not really. This is about silencing Christians through whatever means possible and removing Christianity from America. What's at stake is the entire culture war. What is this battle against? What we believe, guys. He said the decision is an expression of hostility towards people who take their Christianity seriously. Sorry, that's us. Do we take it seriously? Absolutely. And the battle lines are drawn. And we have to stand up for what's, for what's right and be a light in a nation that's growing darker and darker. You know, for this rebellion with, the, with Korah, listen to the end of this rebellion in Numbers 16, verses 31 through 35. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split under them, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. That, again, is what's ahead for these apostates, these false teachers. The way of Korah was rebellion, rebellion against the authority of God. Now, again, you may be thinking, all right, Pastor Joe, I see what you're saying. These false teachers have gone the way of Cain and unbelief. They've run greedily with the heir of Balaam for profit, and they perished in the rebellion of Korah. So what? So what do we do about all this? What did Jude say? Behold, while I was very diligent to write to you among a, concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are to be about, to earnestly contend for this faith that's been entrusted to us. It will get more and more difficult in the days ahead. But you, that's why you have to know what you believe. Because how are you going to stand up for something you don't know anything about? Be in God's word. 
pray for his direction, ask for just compassion and love for the people of this world because that's our mission, to bring the gospel. May we contend for the faith. Let's pray. Father, again, this is not an easy series to go through, and yet it's important, Lord, or it wouldn't be in here. And I just pray that we understand these things. How we're to contend for the faith, not to in in a unloving manner, but to explain the truth. And if, if they don't want to hear the truth, then we have to move on. We just can't accept the false teaching any longer. It's time for us to take a stand, a stand for you, Lord, and to shine brightly in a world that is just dark and dismal. But boy, your light shines even brighter in those dark times, and thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to live to serve you. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.